Well, good morning. We're trying uh, uh, something new today. We're in Romans. Today's lesson is in chapter 8. But actually, there's a whole lot of territory that probably needs to be covered before we actually start on the lesson. We haven't met now for about uh, four or five weeks. And so there's a lot of uh, Romans that we haven't covered um, the last uh, at least five weeks, I think. So let's go ahead and have a word of prayer, and then we'll get started. Heavenly Father, thank you for another day, and, and thank you thank you for our help that we're able to be up and about, and pray, Lord, you just touch those in a special way that aren't, aren't well today, those that aren't uh, feeling uh, up to speed. Those that may have the virus, I pray, Lord, you just touch them in a way that the virus will just quickly go away. Pray that you'll be with us today as we study your lesson. Pray you'll just open our eyes that we can see and, and our ears that we can hear and, and our hearts that we can understand the truths that you have for us today. Pray you go with us. Be with us as we uh, endeavor to, to do your will, even though there's many obstacles along the way. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The lesson actually starts way back in uh, Genesis, if you want to get, get to it. So I generally like to kind of set the scene. It's a little bit of review that we might need to do in terms of what Romans is. Uh, Romans is, is difficult to understand for some people, but when you, when you really look at it, Paul approaches salvation in a logical, step-wise way. If you look at chapters 1 through 3 and some of 4, he's talking about sin. All have sinned. There's no way of getting around it. We have the sin nature, and that started way back with Adam and Eve. I'll touch on that just uh, in a few minutes. Um, in chapters uh, 4 through 7, he talks about salvation and justification. Justification is being right with God, and we can't do that on our own. It takes the righteousness of Jesus that puts us in right standing with God. And then uh, chapter 8, we actually get into sanctification. Sanctification, I think, is a word that is, is misunderstood in, in many cases. Uh, sanctification in the Bible has about three different uh, understandings, three different applications. <clears throat> when we are saved, we are sanctified. We are set aside for God. But in the process of living the Christian life, we are continuing sanctification. <clears throat> sanctification is an ongoing process. Then, ultimately, we have the final sanctification at our glorification as we enter the kingdom of God in heaven. Uh, the ongoing sanctification is such that to try to understand maybe in a, a, a very simple way, uh, if you want to bake a, say, a birthday cake, you mix up the dough, you put it in the, uh, the pans, cook it, you set them out to cool when it's done, you have two layers of cake, that's the birthday cake. That's sanctification at salvation but it's not really a final finished birthday cake after it cools down you put the icing on it you may put uh, some kind of a, a happy birthday uh, maybe put some decorations on it and then you put some candles you see baking the birthday cake is an ongoing process sanctification when we are saved we are sanctified, set aside for God. But the understanding here is we don't stay the way we are. We grow spiritually. I've said many times, 
God doesn't expect us to clean ourselves up before we're saved. We come as we are, but we don't stay as we are. That's right. We grow spiritually. If we are the same person 20 years after we've been saved that we were when we were saved, uh, we need to reevaluate. We need to see where we are, uh, where we've been, where we're going. But the whole idea is that we are growing spiritually. The old song, He's Still Working on Me, is very applicable to this. So anyway, we have, have those three uh, ways that um, Paul has uh, presented, um, I guess, the chapters here. But we see also there's an, another theme that he has. Chapters 1 through 3 is God, the Father in creation. Setting everything in motion. Then we see that uh, four through seven with the salvation, it's the Son of God in salvation. Then we get the sanctification, that's the Holy Spirit in salvation and in sanctification. So we have the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are involved in these first eight chapters. We see that uh, we start on chapter 8, verse 12 in the lesson. Now, here's, here's the uh, quarterly that we use in our class. But turn to uh, Romans chapter 8 if you haven't already turned. But the first 11 verses really gets into to the doctrine of the gospel and so forth. But we're starting on verse 12. But I, I would like to touch on something um, actually back in Genesis. Uh, let's, let's just go back to Genesis chapter 3. If you have your Bibles. Genesis chapter 3 is where Adam and Eve are in the garden. God created a perfect state of living. Adam and Eve, they had everything they needed, everything that they could, they could possibly want, and God gave them one commandment. One commandment. It says you can eat of all the fruit of the garden except for the fruit of one tree. That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They could eat of the tree of life, live forever, I suppose. Time had no meaning. So the whole idea here is that they had one commandment. All they had to worry about is just don't eat this tree. We don't know how long it took them before they kept looking at that tree. Oh, I see the tree. It, it could have been a year. It could have been a thousand years. We don't know. The Bible is silent on that. But everything was perfect. Adam and Eve were spiritual beings as far as their life goes. There was no evil there. We have now two natures. We have the natural man or natural person, and we have the spiritual person. So Adam and Eve went along just fine until finally one day, you know, the old serpent came up to them and tempted them and they yield to the to that temptation and we know what happened they ate fruit but but we see here that uh, God had a plan and they sort of messed up on that plan he was fellowshipping with them he would walk with them in the garden you remember fellowship with God they had a closeness but that all passed away because of what? One word, disobedience. God expects us to obey his word. God hates sin. Disobedience is sin. And sin is a penalty that has to be paid for. The wages of sin is what? Death. 
So the day that they ate the fruit, they had a reckoning with God. And if we look at uh, chapter 8, after God talks to Adam and Eve and gives them the uh, uh, penalty, I guess. But he goes on to say uh, in chapter uh, 8, verse 17, I mean, chapter uh, 3, 17, and unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shall it spring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb or herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground out of it. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art. Is God had told them in chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, and the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So, did Adam and Eve die when they ate the fruit? Well, not physically, but they died spiritually. But they began to die physically. Their bodies started deteriorating. And after so many years, they died physically. So we have a spiritual death and a physical death. And then later we have an eternal death. So in the garden, Adam and Eve died spiritually. They began to die physically. So now let's look at the lesson. Chapter 8, Romans verse 12, chapter 8. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if we live after the flesh, we shall die. But if through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. So once we are physically dying and already spiritually dead, we have hope. And that hope is in the death, resurrection, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, we can look here. Um, sin has to be paid for. God can't take sin. We have to pay the price. But we can't pay it. We have to have somebody to come and pay the price for us. To redeem us. And that's what Jesus did. But once we accept and believe and become sanctified, we're set apart for God, we are no longer living after the flesh, but we're living after the spirit. We are born spiritually now. We have died spiritually back in Adam and in this day and age, DNA is a big thing. Everybody wants to get a DNA to see where they came from. Uh, I believe that if you want to uh, apply the DNA concept, that once Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, their DNA had that uh, sin, had that filth, had that... Uh, whatever you want to call it, added to their DNA. And that has passed on to generation to generation. We are evil when we're born. Sin is already in us. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him what, should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. But, but he went on to say that you're already condemned. 
When we're born, we're condemned. We're condemned already, if you read read on to verse 18 and so forth. Uh, but there is hope. We're condemned, but we have the fleshly body that's still with us. Our bodies with the flesh are always in contention with our bodies that are spiritual. So we are, as Paul says, we can be a natural man or a spiritual man. But we can't do away with the natural man. The idea here, the natural man has power. We're always facing temptation to do this, to do that, and to, to do the other. The flesh is a powerful thing. Uh, in the spirit, uh, we're weak, though, in the spirit ourselves. But with the Holy Spirit within us, we have all the strength to overcome. We shall overcome through the Holy Spirit's help. We're nothing on our own. So he says, if we live after the flesh, we shall die. The only hope is we are reborn. Uh, the example here is that Paul says in Galatians um, chapter 2, verse 20, he says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So the idea, although we're dead in sins, the natural man is still there. And there's always a fight between the natural man and the spiritual man. And the lesson today, if you look at uh, chapter 7, I think can, this could be made maybe a little, a little more clear. Paul talks in chapter 7 that there's, there's a conflict within himself. The things that he knows he should do, he doesn't end up doing them. But the things that he knows he shouldn't do, he ends up doing them. Isn't that us? We know what we need to do. The spiritual uh, aspect of spirit leads us and, and we don't do it. But then we feel bad about it, but, but we don't do it. But, but the fleshly man, he won't feel bad about it. So uh, the whole idea here is that there's enmity there between the spirit and the flesh. So we're, we're constantly faced with that. And if old Paul was... Certainly, we should realize that we are too. We're, we're, we're vulnerable to the same thing. So, so the things he would he knows he should do, sometimes he doesn't do. The things he knows he shouldn't do, sometimes he does. He goes on to say, chapter 7, verses 24, 25, and then the first verse of chapter 8. He says, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Who will deliver? He goes on to say in verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. We're still sinners. We still sin. But the Holy Spirit within us convicts us of that sin. And when we sin, we don't keep on sinning because we feel bad. We feel guilt. The Holy Spirit leads us to repent. But the unsaved person, the man of the flesh, the natural man, he, he sins and doesn't face him a bit. He goes on and goes on and goes on and lives a life of sin. The life of flesh. So the life of flesh continues to sin. The life of the Spirit feels awfully bad, feels guilt because of leading the Holy Spirit and repents and turns. So that's the main main difference that I see between the spiritual man and the fleshly man. We're still fleshly. The flesh is still there. We yield to the flesh sometimes, but we don't do it 
continually, continually. Sin is our master if we continue in sin. God, Jesus, is our master if we repent of that sin because the Holy Spirit convicts us of that sin. So, so bear that in mind. We are debtors, not to the flesh. We're debtors to God. We're debtors to Jesus who paid the price to live not, not after the flesh. But if we live after the flesh, we're going to die. We're already dead physically. We're dead spiritually. But there's hope. Just as we are baptized, Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ, right? Christ went to the grave. And he rose again. As we are baptized, we, we celebrate that whole aspect. We are buried in the water to signify that we died to sin. Although we're still sinful, we've died to that sinful nature. And as Jesus rose again, we rise to the new person. We've been dead just like Jesus rose again in the resurrection. Once we're dead in sin, we are resurrected. What do we call that? We've been born again, a new life. So, so we're now a spiritual person. Now, the next section talks about once we're now saved, we are now sanctified, we are growing, we're not staying the way we were. Uh, we can't clean ourselves up good enough to be saved, but boy, once we're saved, then the cleaning process begins. So Paul goes on to say in verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now, we know that that's sons and daughters. A better translation might be daughters of God, but no, children of God is, is what we see as we read on. So, I'll read this whole section and not comment anymore. For uh, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, we cry Abba, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together, also glorified together. For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Um, it's kind of deep, but if we're led by the Spirit of God, it's sort of like Jesus talking to the Good Shepherd. The sheep hear my voice. And they follow me. We're not forced into following, but we voluntarily follow because we are led by Jesus. But for as many as are led by the Spirit, we are now the children of God. What does children mean? We're part of the family of God. I'm so glad we can be part of the family of God. You know, we sing that. Um, but we've not received the spirit of bondage to be fearful again, which is, is the, the natural, fleshly person. No, we don't have that. We have the spirit of adoption. We are now part of a family that cares for one another, that loves one another, that will do anything. Uh, Jesus says, scarcely will a man give his life for someone. But... Sometimes somebody will lay down his life. So, so this is a, a new culture that uh, uh, the fleshly person doesn't understand. And with the spirit of adoption, we have a different relationship with God. We don't fear God. He's like our daddy. So we pray our, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's uh, uh, the um, 
the Lord's, what we call the Lord's Prayer, the model prayer. But uh, um, I feel more comfortable when I pray our Father. You know, God is my daddy, I guess, my spiritual daddy. So, so if we have a relationship, we're children, we're adopted into the family, we're different people. Then he says, if, if we're children, we're heirs. Uh, back in uh, biblical time, the firstborn son got a double portion of the inheritance. Everybody else just got, got a single portion. But um, even in Roman times, uh, bear in mind, in, in this church, Paul is really writing to saved people. He's writing to the Christians. And some of them were Jews. Some of them were Romans, Roman citizens. So, so both understood what he's saying about adoption, but it's a little different about being a joint heir. We're joint heirs with Jesus. That, that's something amazing. So Jesus is our, our brother if we're saved. But it goes on to say we're joint heirs if so be that we suffer with him. How do we suffer? Well, parts of the world, people are really persecuted. They're harmed. They're injured. They're put in jail. They're beaten. Sometimes they're killed. Uh, we're fortunate in this country, but it's, it's getting worse. We're ridiculed. Matter of fact, we're called uh, hateful people now, right? And we're called uh, racist. We're called homophobes because the Bible uh, speaks about uh, negative on homosexuality. But we can't say anything about it unless we're uh, willing to be persecuted. So, so we are suffering some with Jesus. But he says, I reckon... It's sort of like he, he's ha having a, a column here of the, the goods and the bads here. He, he puts them all down, but he finds that, that the sufferings and so forth of this life are nothing compared to the benefits and the uh, what's going to come to us when our glory is revealed in us. In other words, when we finally reach the end of our sanctification, glorification. So so he's looking forward to that. But but we're we're now not out here fighting the world and trying to get all the gusto we can. We only go around once, get all you can. No. That that's a rat race. We're now working toward something better than what we had. Um, works won't get us saved, but God expects us to do, do some things in this life. We don't just sit back and, and do nothing. We need to get involved. We need to let our lives be worthwhile to him. Um, the spiritual person should bear fruit. And if we look at Galatians uh, chapter 5, Paul contrasts when, when he's writing to the church at Galatia um, the works of the flesh and the works of the spirit. If we look at chapter 5, verses 19 through um, 21, he says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, uh, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. If you miss one, that covers it. Uh, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That's the fleshly person. He has to die to sin. He has to be reborn into the newness of life. He becomes a new creature. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, faithfulness, 
meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. So Paul makes it pretty clear that the person of the flesh, the man of flesh, the woman of flesh, lives for all of these things that he mentioned in chapter uh, 5, 19 through 21. But the spirit-led person will bear the fruit. Now, it's not fruits. We don't uh, say, well, I bear this fruit and I bear the other, but we should bear all of those fruits, all of them. And some of us have to work a little hard on some of them. Patience is, is a hard one to work on. Um, but anyway, we have to bear that in mind. So we, we ha have a condition here where the spirit-led person is what we want to be, what we ought to be, because death is all that, that the other person can experience because God requires the debt to be paid. It's sort of like if, if you make a phone call and it rings and rings and rings and nobody answers it, is that a, a phone call? Well, you made an attempt. It's an attempt. But if somebody answers, you have completed the call. So God, I believe in his, his wisdom, calls everybody. Some of us don't answer the phone. So you answer the phone. Now you go on to the progression of sanctification and you grow in the spirit. You answer the call. Final section here. We're just about done. Well, it's not quite final, uh, but, but we're just about not done. Um, he says, for the earnest, this is uh, verses 19 through 22, for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willing, willingly, but um, by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself shall be delivered from, uh, shall also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Well, see, he's referring now to what, what I read in, in Genesis. Not only was man cast out of the garden and had to worked by the sweat of his brow and thorns and everything, uh, that indicates that the creation was punished also. And the creation is groaning, groaneth and travaileth to be renewed back to the original state of the Garden of Eden. Personifies uh, uh, the creation. But not only was man cast out from the perfect garden, so was creation. And creation yearns to be delivered, just as man yearns to be delivered. But it says, groaneth until now. Well, we're, we're still corrupt. The, the world is still corrupt. The environment is corrupt. But until now... I think what he's trying to say here is that through Jesus and the resurrection and the new birth and everything, there is hope. We didn't have any hope. The law couldn't be uh, reconciled. The, the law for nearly 1,400 years, God tried or, or Maybe, maybe I shouldn't say it that way, but it was God's intent to teach the people the necessity of sin being paid for. Sin had to be covered. And 
he tried for 14 years to teach the Jews that sin had to be paid for. The whole idea was uh, they offered the sacrifice for this sin. They offered another sacrifice for this sin. On the Day of Atonement, the pre high priest would offer, you remember the, the goat, and then let one free go free. But that was to cover, just cover the sins. It didn't do away with the sins. It didn't take care of the sin, but it covered them for a year. They had to do that another year, another year, another year. But the creation now knows that there is a provision now that this is, is the, the law didn't really work. People couldn't keep the law, but the law was good. Paul says in, uh, I think it's chapter six, the law was good because it showed us our sinfulness. The law was our schoolmaster. It taught us what was right and what was wrong. And it made us aware that we are sinful people. We sin and we can't keep from it. We can't keep from it on our own. That We need somebody to redeem us. We need a redeemer. And this is what, what he's talking about here. We expect, there's an expectation that everything is going to be made right. The world will be a new crea creation as well as we are a new creation. And uh, we read in Revelation, the new heaven and the new earth. So uh, that gets a little, little, little deep there. So the final section here says, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why does he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then we with patience wait for it. So we've already seen where we're, we are adopted into the family of God. So, so we're in the family of God here, but the ultimate family of God with God. I think that's what he's talking about here. We're waiting for, for the real adoption, the redemption of our body, where we will be in our glorified state, as Jesus in his glorified body, with fellow believers in heaven, with God. And I don't know what that is. I don't understand what heaven is. I can't fathom the whole thing, but that's, that's what he's getting at. Humanity will be restored. Our adoption will be complete. Uh, it's sort of like um, when he says over here, we have the adoption paper. You know, the judge is signed and everything. We're adopted, but we haven't, haven't quite gone into the, the house with the family. And that's what it's talking about here. So that's, that's what I see with the lesson. Um, Romans covers a lot of territory. It's a logical, as I said, a logical approach, sin, salvation, sanctification, and glorification. He, he goes all the way through it. We ought to read the Bible. The Roman road, we're all familiar with the Roman road, starts out. Romans 3.10, it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 5.8, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 10.9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, thou shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. 10.13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's all in Romans, and there's more to come, and I'm done. <laughs> Let's uh, dismiss. Heavenly Father, thank you for the lesson.